Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Murdoch Mind, Body, Spirit series. I'm Gina Murdoch, and I want to thank my husband, Jerry Murdoch, for uh, supporting this series with me. We are really honored and pleased to be able to do that, to sponsor a series called the Mind, Body, Spirit series. Are you guys all familiar with the Aspen idea up here in the Aspen Institute? Yeah. Woo! I know there's some people from Down Valley here. Let's give a little shout out, Down Valley. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. Well, obviously you're here because you want to learn how to live longer, but not just longer, uh, we want to learn how to live better. And I think here in Aspen, we do have some great examples. We hosted a meeting earlier today of stakeholders in Aspen. We were convening to think about, could we become a blue zone here in Aspen? And one of the people I invited was Klaus Obermeier, who's one of my heroes. Yeah! We love Klaus. He's 90, I said 95, he corrected me, he's 96. He skis quite often, especially with the Bluebird days, and uh, swims here, and uh, we love that. It's so inspirational. So how many of you here are, is anyone actually over, let's say, 80? They, uh, nice, awesome. <laughs> Welcome. You know, sometimes we don't, we don't get that spectrum here in Aspen because it's full of young and fit people, and there is a spectrum. And I just want to say, when I was walking over to this venue earlier today, I was struck by the natural beauty of where we live. And then walking into this uh, auditorium, thinking how special it is for us to be here. So I just want to take a mindful moment, which I like to do in this series, because it's mind, body, and spirit, to just take a moment, take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, just calm and center and ground yourself into this space. We all live these very busy lives, and yet when you take a moment to pause, you realize how lucky we are to live here. And for those of you that are visiting, you're really lucky to visit here. I know our, our speaker, Tony Butner, was talking about how lucky he feels to be able to visit here and his beautiful wife, Tammy. We uh, feel really, really honored to be able to present this program to you tonight, Blue Zones Live Longer and Better. We don't want to forget that part. So this is the first series of the Murdoch Mind, Body, Spirit series this year. We have uh, several other speakers coming. Right uh, around the corner is Sakyong Mipam Rinpoche. That's a program that I think will surely sell out. That's March 11th, so be sure to buy your tickets. Uh, a little bit about Tony. He's been doing work in many cities around the globe, actually. I hope you're going to tell your stories to start off, there's some incredible adventure stories. He puts some of our greatest adventures to shame here. So he'll tell you a little bit about that. He's led expeditions, and he is the man that leads the Blue Zone Community Program and Initiative. And we brought him here literally to think about, would this be a good fit for Aspen? And so for those of you that think that's a good idea, which I do, um, I left some feedback forms outside, and, and just think about that when you're leaving. If you have some feedback or some ideas, we'd love to take that, and uh, we're going to work with it and move forward on our project here, bringing a more cohesive well-being uh, initiative into this area. So the Blue Zones, they are working in eight states and 30 communities across the country to date, and we are excited to maybe be a part of that. I want you to really enjoy this presentation. It's a lot about learning things that in some ways you may already know how to live longer and better, but you may not do. But maybe if we all look at it together, it will be more enticing. So enjoy the presentation and join me in welcoming Tony Butner to the stage. Thank you very much. I gotta do something real quick. I was pinching myself. I am so incredibly honored to be here. I'd like to thank um, uh, Jerry and, and Nina Burdock and the Institute for having me and my wife. It's been an extraordinary visit and I am absolutely honored to stand on this stage. How many of you love living here in Aspen? Raise your hand or in the valley. How many of you would love to live here longer, better raise your hand? <laughs> Me. I'm gonna start tonight with a short video. 
On the right-hand side, it's a side-by-side. -side. On the right-hand side, you're gonna see what we believe is a Blue Zones life. And on the left-hand side, you're gonna see what's happening here in America. So let's go ahead and start with that. <laughs> What will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. Isn't that impactful? <laughs> this is real. Researchers tell us here in America the human body is built to live to a healthy age 90. The reality, on average, we live to age 78. We're leaving 12 good years on the table. And what we believe we've done at Blue Zones is identified ways from the longest lived populations in the world for individuals, families, organizations, and even communities to take some of these good years back. So when I start a talk, I, I always like to um, tell people how this all got started. You see, I come from a family of four boys. Um, I was born and raised in St. Paul, Minnesota. My a father was an educator, my mother was a stay-at-home mom, and as we grew up, all of us boys were friends. We, were, we did sports together. Uh, we went on adventures together. We came to Colorado and trout fished and hiked and mountain biked, and, and we liked each other. So as we started to graduate from high school and college, my older brother Dan came to us and said, listen, I think we should go on one last great adventure before we go out into our careers. He said, let's go on a bike ride. So what we did and what the team did is we put our back tire in the Antarctic Ocean and bicycled 15,000 miles to the southern tip of South America. Now, for those of you that have seen a globe before, if you look at it, it's all downhill. It's really not that big a deal. It's just a really long hill. Two years later, Dan came to us again and said, why don't we go on a bike ride from St. Paul to Minneapolis? And for those of you that, that might not know that, uh, it's about 10 miles. So I said, well, I got some free time on Saturday. Uh, let's do it. Well, Unfortunately, with Dan, uh, he decided to go the long way. So again, the team bicycled around the 45th parallel, the first to traverse the Soviet Union, left from Minneapolis and arrived in St. Paul. And then two years later, the team put their bicycle tires in the northern tip of Africa, biked through the Sahara Desert, through Central Africa, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, ended in Cape Town. So the reason that I show you these trips is not to brag about accomplishments. It's to show you what it did to our family, what it did for Dan. It turned us into explorers and adventurers. It showed us that there were different ways people ate, different ways they set up their homes, different ways they set up their faith-based communities and their social networks, and it set us out on a path of exploration. The next expeditions that Dan led was called the Quest Network, and he started them to solve some mysteries of the world. Things like what happened to the Mayan civilization or what is the secret to longevity? So the first one was we hired experts around the Mayan civilization. We actually embedded ourselves in Central America for about six months. But what was really interesting about this opportunity is that we uplinked with over a million students around the country, and we uplinked every night and on Friday, we had them vote on what direction the expedition went. And it was a huge success. It caught the eye of National Geographic. Something called the Danish Twin Studies has established that our longevity is tied to our genes by only 20%. And I think that's counterintuitive to people. 
I think they think, oh, that family has big, good genes. They're going to live forever. Well, the reality is 80% of how long you live is tied to your environment and your lifestyles. So the premise for Blue Zones was if we could find the right environments, the right lifestyles that support longevity, we'd have the de facto recipe. Our approach was to find de demographically confirmed and geographically defined areas where people are living extraordinary long lives. In some case, to age 100 at 10 times the rate we do here in America with just a fraction of chronic disease that we have here. So after 15 years of embedding ourselves into these cultures with experts, we find what we call the blue zones. And it's here to these blue zones that we look for the secrets of longevity. And we found nine commonalities that you see over and over and over again. And I'll share those with you um, in a little bit. With a, NAN, uh, with a grant from National Geographic and the National Institute of Aging, um, we set out to find the brightest and the best. Uh, epidemiologists, anthropologists, uh, medical researchers, demographers, and nutritionists to come with us on these uh, trips. We found our first blue zones here on the island of Sardinia, about 150 miles off the coast of Italy. It is here that you find the longest lived men. They live 10 good years on average longer than we do here in America. It's also interesting, on average for every one centenarian man, there's four centenarian women. Here it's one to one. So what do we find here? Here in America, for every 6,000 births that we have, we yield one centenarian. Here in this bullseye region, the Noro province of Sardinia, for every 1,000 births, there's four centenarians. We find a Bronze Age culture, a culture made up of shepherds. So you see men and women out with their flocks for weeks at a time, low intensity exercise, moving naturally. Back in the villages, you don't see many cars. So you see people walking, you see them biking. Um, you see almost every trip affords some natural movement, taking the kids to school, going to church, going shopping. What we found here was a population that ate primarily a plant-based diet. 95% of what they eat is plants. They either grow it, uh, they get it at the market, they exchange with neighbors. You see it's supplemented with fruits and legumes and nuts. Um, and we do see them eating a little bit of animal protein. Typically it was goat or chicken uh, or pork, but portion size was very, very important. On average, they eat it about five times a month and only about three to four ounces. And let me tell you, when they do finally get that pork, uh, they're pretty excited about that. <laughs> yeah, they get real excited about that. We see a population that's created a portable diet. Pictured here is a Pondi Musica. It's unleavened bread made out of durum wheat, and they just put it in their packs and they go. This is a population that has created a cheese made out of sheep's milk. It's called pecorino cheese. It's delicious. It's easy to get here in America, and it's very high in omega-3 fatty acids. And everywhere we went, we saw people drinking wine. They had vineyards. That yeah, sounds good, doesn't it? They'd have vineyards, but it wasn't like you were seeing people just getting bombed and hanging out by themselves. They were with family or they were with friends and it was almost always um, with a healthy meal. And we had this wine tested, it's called Caninau wine. It has three times the level of polyphenols or artery scrubbing compounds. And I can tell you after many Friday and Saturday nights there, it tastes good too. But what really amazed us about this culture was how they set up their society. As you get older here, you are more revered. You are not put into retirement homes. You're actually kept very close by your extended family. And we know that aging parents that are kept close from their family live on average four to six years longer than those that don't. What we also found here for the first time is what's called the grandmother effect. The children of these extended families live longer, excuse me, have lower rates of infant mortality and um, disease. This is a culture where you see 103 year old men biking to work, chopping wood, 
and beating a man 65 years younger than them in an arm wrestling tournament. I have to tell you, this is the favorite part of my talk. This is my older brother, Dan Butner, founder and CEO <laughs> of Blue Zones. And let me tell you, growing up, he picked on me. He has never seen me do a speech. I've done 200 of them around the country, and I get to show people him getting whooped by a guy 65 years older than him. We found our second blue zone on the archipelago of Okinawa. This is ground zero for longevity. Okinawa has what every city in America wants. They have the longest lived women. They live 12 good years longer than we do here in America. They have an extraordinary profile. They have the longest disability life expectancy in the world. On average, the population lives seven good years longer than we do here in America. They have five times as many centenarians, one-fifth the rate of breast and colon cancer, and one-sixth the rate of cardiovascular disease. It's absolutely amazing. Well, people say, well, that's a homogeneous population. That doesn't count. No. It is a heterogeneous population. It is a cultural melting pot. Well, what do we find here? Well, we find, again, a plant-based diet. About 95% of what they're eating is plant-based. We saw some fruits and vegetables we knew, and some we had no idea. Can anyone tell me what this vegetable is? Raise your hand. Close, very close. So it's called Goya or bitter melon. And what they do with it is chop it up, and they saute it in their stir fries. And what's so interesting about this vegetable, and you can get it here, it's been proven to kill cancer cells, clean your blood, and reduce inflammation. We find a culture that's eating lots and lots of legumes. Uh, they eat seven times as much tofu as we do here in America. And for the first time, we see a culture stopping every day and downshifting. And when I say that, I mean taking a break and reversing stress. And they do it with what they call ancestor veneration. They stop every morning and they think about the people that came before them and their family. They relax, they downshift. Something called the Framingham Study has established that isolation and loneliness kills. Everyone in this room understands that. 30 years ago, the average American had three best friends that they could count on on a good day and a bad day, and they would listen. Today, we're down to one and a half. We're becoming this isolated society. If you were lucky enough to be born into an Okinawan culture, you would have been put into what's called a moai. And what this stands for is a committed social network. So at about age two, they take the women and the little boys, or kids little boys, down to the city center, and they're put into a group of five or eight boys, five or eight girls, and these moais travel through life together, supporting each other in good times and bad. These women have been in this moai for 97 years. Their average age is 101 years of age. And we know that this committed social network has a profound effect on this population. But that's not to say they still don't argue about that hot guy they still loved in high school because they do. I was there and I saw it. Can anyone tell me the two most dangerous years of life for Americans? Anyone? Nice work. Usually someone says, oh, when you're 15, and my mom agrees with that, but it is. It's the year you're born because of infant mortality, and it's the year you retire. And I ask you all, why is that? Do we retire and just start doing drugs and drinking too much and, and just risky behaviors? No. Researchers believe it has to do with purpose. We travel through life with this profound sense of purpose, and then all of a sudden, one day, it's all askew. What we found in Okinawa was a language that didn't even have a word for retirement. Instead, we heard over and over again, my icky guy. And when we had that translated, it simply meant the reason I get up in the morning, that sense of purpose. And researchers show us those people that have that sense of purpose live seven years longer than those that don't. This 103-year-old karate master Zicky guy was just simply sharing his art. This 97-year-old fisherman's Zicky guy was spearfishing every day to bring fresh fish to his family. 
97 years old. I wish. And this woman's ikigai was simply her family. At 104 years old, this woman is pictured here with her great, great, great granddaughter. Two women separated by four generations. And we asked her, how does it feel to hold this fourth generation? She put her head back and said, like leaping into heaven. We found America's Blue Zone in an extraordinary, confusing place. <laughs> you get in the car and you drive through the pollution of the San Bernardino Freeway. You hit the Loma Linda exit, you take a right-hand turn, you get to the top of the exit, and on the left-hand side is a Del Taco, and on the right-hand side is a Wiener Hut. You have arrived at America's Blue Zones. <laughs> really. So what's happening here? This is a city that has the same challenges that every other city in America has. But what we found here was a large concentration of seven-day Adventists. And something called the Adventist Health Study has been tracking this population for over 30 years, and it's considered a gold standard epidemiology study. And from it, we were able to get some great data. Uh, here in America, on average, women live to about age 80, but amongst these Adventists, they live to age 89. For men, we live to about age 76, but here they're living 11 years longer. A population here in America living 10 good years longer than any other city. There's no magic here. What, what's going on? Again, we see a cultural melting pot. A heterogeneous population, but we see a population implementing habits that support longevity. They take their diet directly from the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 29, where it talks about fruits and legumes and greens. This is a culture that takes a 24-hour sanctuary of time. So again, we start seeing that downshifting again. From sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday, they stop everything. It doesn't matter if the kids need to go to a ball game, they need gas in the car, or a gallon of milk. They stop everything. They focus on three things, faith, family, and friends. They take nature walks. So we see this, this moving naturally concept again. During the sanctuary of time, you often see them eating and sharing vegetarian potlucks. They go to someone's house, everyone brings their favorite healthy meal, they eat together, they talk together, they support each other, and we know the sense of community has a profound effect on this population. This is a population that has given us a 106-year-old active cowboy, Mr. Ed Rawlings. Ed starts his day with a swim. And like a good Minnesotan, on the weekends, he still puts on the boards. <laughs> Incredible. This is a population that has yielded this gentleman, multimillionaire, 97-year-old Ellsworth Wareham. When he was quoted $6,000 for a privacy fence, he said, for that price, I'll do it myself. And we watched him for four days dig footings, mix concrete, put in stringers, build a fence, and as you can imagine, on the fourth day, he ended up in the emergency room. What's amazing about this photograph, though, is this isn't Ellsworth Wareham. This is Ellsworth Wareham. <laughs> At age 97, he still assists with 20 open-heart surgeries a month. And now I'd like to introduce you to the Butner Boy's favorite centenarian, 104-year-old Mrs. Marge Jutan. Okay, get this. Marge starts her day with what she calls a prune juice shooter. <laughs> Let that go in one ear and then get it out of there. You don't want that in there. She starts her day lifting weights. She gets on her stationary bike. And then she jumps in a root beer colored Cadillac and wails down the San Bernardino Freeway where she still volunteers to seven organizations. I said, Marge, why are you working so hard? She goes, Tony, somebody's got to look out for them old folks. <laughs> now, not many of you know me, but I've been in two earthquakes over seven. I've been through two hurricanes. I've flipped a car on a mountain road. I had a gun put in my mouth. I was beat 
by gypsies in Romania. But I've never had a more harrowing experience in riding shotgun from Argentan. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> We found the fourth blue zone on the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. It is here that the whole population has three times the chance to live to a healthy age 90. Again, we start seeing habits here, commonalities. We see people moving naturally. We see people downshifting. We see them eating wisely. They eat um, more or less a Mesopotamian diet, so they're eating legumes and, and corn and squash. And we see them connecting to their population. It's here that you see aging men marrying young wives. And research shows that that affords an additional three years of uh, <laughs> longevity. And uh, guess what? I did that. No. <laughs> we found our last blue zone. And this was really the only isolated uh, blue zone we found up until about the 1970s. It is here that you see a perfect storm of longevity behaviors. And what it has yielded is a population of 8,000 people that live eight good years longer than we do with almost no dementia and no chronic disease. So what do we see here? Well, same thing. People are moving naturally. They're connected. Um, they're downshifting. Faith is important. They're eating mostly a plant-based diet. I was at a wedding here about four months ago, and I don't know if you've ever been to a Greek wedding, but it's very active. You put your arms around each other and you dance all night. It's about three o'clock in the morning, I'm starting to get tired, and I look to my left, and there is a 93-year-old man. I look to my right, and there's a 97-year-old man dancing at three in the morning. There's this profound sense of movement and activity and culture. What we found here that was unique, though, were these herbs and spices. There's over 150 of them that just grow wild. And the Icarians cook with them. They infuse drinks and teas with them. They actually even put them into their honey. And early research is, is showing a connection between these herbs and these spices and the lack of, more, uh, of dementia. It is here we ran into this guy, Stomites moriartes. What he did was, he fought in World War II. He actually mangled his arm, he was injured, and he couldn't get proper medical attention. He ended up sneaking on to the QE2. He arrived in New York and worked his way north to a place called Port Jefferson, New York, very high concentration of, of Greeks there. He quickly got his arm healed. Uh, he, he met a girl. Um, he became a painter. Uh, they got married, they bought a house. They had three kids. He was living the American dream until about age 65, when he was a little out of breath, kind of like I am here uh, in Aspen. Um, he went to his doctor, and his doctor came back and said, Stomitis, I'm sorry, I have some bad news. You have uncurable, four-stage lung cancer. Get your um, life in order, you have six months to live. Stomitis didn't believe it. He ended up going to three other doctors. They told him the same thing. So what did he do? He didn't go on chemo or radiation. He actually decided to move back to Korea. He said, if I'm going to die, I want to be buried with my ancestors. So the first couple months he's back, some old childhood friends come by. They were, you know, talking and socializing, sipping a little wine. After a couple months, he started feeling a little better. And he said, you know what, I can't lay in this bed anymore. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to plant a garden. I won't be able to harvest it, but my family will. He wanted to get outside, he wanted to feel that sun, and feel that salt uh, air. So he went out and planted a garden. Six months came and went, he didn't die. He actually started to feel better and he just eased himself back into Icarian life. This is a true story. It's been captured in the New York Times and, and fact-checked. Um, it's called the island that forgot to die, but this is also a metaphor. None of these centenarians that we met woke up in the morning and said, listen, I'm going to try to live to age 100. They had lifestyles and lived in environments that subtly but relentlessly nudged them into healthy behaviors. So we came back. Dan wrote an article for National Geographic. To date, it's the second most read edition 
in their 128 year history. People wanna learn, how can I live longer, better? He went on to write a book called Blue Zones that captures the commonalities, a New York Times bestseller, was hired by National Geographic to find the happiest places in the world and capture that work and thrive. And about six months ago, um, wrote the Blue Zone Solution, which captures the 100 year food history of all five Blue Zones and gives people recipes and nudges how to optimize their homes and um, how to eat and, and uh, starts to talk about some of the population health initiatives that we've done. We found nine commonalities. Everywhere we went, you see the same thing. We called them the Power Nine, Secrets to Living a Longer, Better Life. These commonalities point out that a long, happy life can be had by surrounding yourself, your family, and even your community with habits and environments that support longevity. The first one was these populations move naturally. And what I'm saying here is they did not belong to gyms and they did not run marathons. They moved on average every 20 minutes. They were not sedentary, they were moving. They had gardens. They lived in deconvenienced homes. They walked or biked to places. They did not have a button for this electronic and this one. They used their hands, they used their body, they moved naturally. They had the right outlook. These populations knew how to downshift, to reverse stress, to reverse and eliminate the inflammation from stress that is associated with almost every preventative disease. They did it through yoga or meditation or prayer or eating with their family or gardening or like the Sardinians, they just went out to happy hour. They had a sense of purpose and they could articulate it, the reason they were getting up in the morning. The Okinawans called it ikigai. In Costa Rica, it's called Plan de Vida, but they could articulate it and they lived it every day. They ate wisely. In every one of these blue zones, they drank a little bit of alcohol. Typically, it was red wine. It was almost always with friends or family and almost always with a healthy meal. For women, it was about three quarters of a glass. For men, it was about two glasses. And I know what you're thinking out there. No, you can't save up and have 14 on Friday. It doesn't work that way. They ate a plant-based diet. Again, 95% of what they ate was plant-based. We believe legumes are the Blue Zone superfood. They're cheap, they're easy to make, they're filling, they're good for you. They supplement it again with a little bit of goat, uh, fish, chicken, and pork, and portion size, incredibly important. You don't see these populations eating 16 ounce T-bones. About three to four inches um, is about it. They had strategies not to overeat. Now, I love this one. If you get a chance to go home and look at your parents' or grandparents' dinner plates, what you're gonna find, on average, is a 10-inch plate. Now, I want you to go home and measure your plate, and what you're gonna find, on average, is a 13-inch dinner plate. Now, it's only three inches. It doesn't sound like much, right? But when you calculate the surface area, it's 71% more space. And what do you do when you're eating family style? These populations actually pre-plated their food in the kitchen, they put the leftovers away, and they ate in another room. They ate off of smaller plates. They had strategies like this. They would eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pulper. And what the Okinawans did before every meal is they'd close their eyes and they'd say this, Hari Hachebu. And when we had that translated, it simply means stop eating when your stomach is 80% full. <laughs> Imagine being able to do that at every meal and just cut out 20% of your caloric intake. Americans didn't get overweight and obese on thousands of calories. It's, it's hundreds. And this is what we believe the foundation is. They were well connected. They put their families first. They kept their aging parents close, and we know that affords between four and six years of extra longevity. They had monogamous spousal relationships. We know married people live four years longer than those that aren't. And they took care of their kids, and as we get older, that's probably a pretty good idea. This is the one that shocked us. We talked to 243 centenarians, and these people had faith. All but three 
did not belong to a faith-based community. It didn't matter what the religion was. And we know faith has many faces. But research shows people that show up to a faith-based community at least four times a month and are active live four to 14 years longer than those that don't. We do not know why. Is it because of the committed social networks or the healthy behaviors? We don't know. And this is the big one. They belong to the right tribe. And when I say tribe, I mean they were either born into or actively seeked out healthy friendships. And we know these social networks are as contagious as a cold. If your three best friends smoke tobacco, you have a 160% greater chance of smoking. It's the same with depression, loneliness, or obesity. But imagine if these behaviors are healthy and positive, how that would flow through social networks. So we, get, we went on these trips. We have all this great research. Can we just tell America what to do and they'll listen? No. Communities and people are using three strategies to get healthier here in America, and they're spending $110 billion a year. Diets, gym memberships, and supplements. Don't get me wrong, exercising is great for you, but these are short-term wins and long-term strategies that fail, and I'll show you why. If all of us in this room started a diet today, we're going to get skinny. Three months, 10%, they're gone. Seven months, 90% of us are gone. After two years, we'd have 3% of the people on that diet. There is not a diet in the history of men that has helped more than 3% of the population for over a course of two years. It doesn't work. How about gym memberships? It's January 1st, I'm gonna get in shape, right? That model is set up on failure. People start and they give up. And if we could come back with a blue zone pill that you could take every day and live 12 good years longer, we couldn't get enough people to take it. So what works? We, with a grant from National Geographic again, were asked to study community health initiatives around the world that actually worked. When I say worked, I mean it reduced a chronic disease and sustained it. It took two years to find one and it was in North Karelia, Finland. In the early 70s, they had the highest rate of cardiovascular and heart disease in the world. Women and men at age 40 dropping over from heart attacks. In three short years, this team took the focus off of individuals telling people what to do. Instead, of they looked at the environments and the lifestyle people had. Again, what drives longevity? Environments and lifestyles. In three short years, they reduced the heart attacks of working age men by 85% and have sustained that for 30 years. So what our team did was develop an approach to population health. And our thought was this. We're going to take the focus off of individuals and tell them what to do because they're not going to listen. We know, though, that people spend 90% of their time in a life radius of about 10 miles where they live and they work. This is where they live, work, play, and interact. So we said, how about if we put our interventions to that environment and those lifestyles? So we start with individuals. We help them optimize their home. And you're probably thinking, well, what does that mean? I'll give you an example. When you get home tonight, where do you find your fruits and vegetables in your refrigerator? Down below, out of sight, right? Just a little hint, clean out the dirty vegetables, or the rotten vegetables. What Blue Zones would say, how about on Sunday night, just cut the vegetables and fruit up, put them in single serving containers, and put them on the top shelf. Wouldn't that make the healthy choice the easy choice? And how about your pantry? And I'm guilty. You go to your pantry, you open it up, where are the chips and the cookies? Right in front of you. How about putting them up high or down low and put the healthy choices at eye level? Then we work with communities to form moais. How can we get people that want to change their health behavior to commit to walking or biking or healthy eating or discovering purpose? How about purpose workshops? Could we help people find what they're really good at and what they want to do and help them create a mission statement and maybe put those skills to work volunteering? 
We know volunteers suffer lower rates of BMI and lower rates of chronic disease. Then we look at the places people live. How about grocery stores? How can we make healthy choices a little easier there? How about employers? How can we make that environment a little healthier? How about restaurants and maybe schools and faith-based communities? And how about policy? Could we bring best practices to communities to choose food policies and built environment policies, tobacco policies to make environments healthy? Well, this all sounded good. We had a great time doing all this research. What we ended up doing is putting this all into pledges, a list like a Chinese menu of best practice set that all these sectors could actually choose what works for them to optimize their environments and their lifestyles. The question is, would all of this work? No one had ever tried it. In 2007, AARP came to us and they asked us, could you replicate a blue zone here in America? We said we'd love to. So we put out an RFP. We had about 70 cities raise their hand, say we want to do this. And we ended up choosing Albert Lee, Minnesota. And the reason that we chose them, population about 20,000, was because their leadership was aligned. City manager, mayor, city council, employers, restaurants, grocery stores, superintendents, nonprofits, they wanted to change the health trajectory of this city. The first thing we do is come in and listen, understand what's happening, what's working, what's been tried and failed, where's the low hanging fruit. When we talk about the built environment, we bring this gentleman in, his name is Dan Burden. Dan has helped 3,700 cities in America become more walkable, bikeable, and livable. So again, he brings best practices to, to tell the community, to teach them, to listen to them what they want to do and create the right strategies. When we got to Albert Lee, it looked like the downtown was closed for business. 50% of the stores were vacant. They were thinking about widening their main street and increasing their speed limit and just moving people right through town. And we wonder why small towns are collapsing. What we did is put blue zone goggles on them and said, listen, why don't we look at all the four neighborhoods that surround downtown and make sure there's sidewalks? How about bike lanes? Make it easy for people to walk downtown and support those businesses. How about putting the main street on a diet? lowering the speed limit, maybe putting in diagonal parking so you can get more people to support those businesses. How about outside dining, place making, maybe bump outs so that older people can walk across without feeling like they're gonna get run over. Then we turned our attention to the gem of Albert Lee. Fountain Lake, it sits two blocks from downtown, but there's no way to get there. Six lanes of traffic and when you get across, there's nowhere to walk or bike. So with the money they saved in the downtown renovation, they created a blue zone walkway and bike trail around the lake. Now on any given day, you see people walking, biking, socializing, spending time with their family. No diets, no gyms, no supplements. People connecting. Then we turned our focus to the green space. They were fertilizing acres of grass and just cutting it. We said, how about community gardens? They put in 100 community gardens. They sold out the same weekend. Now you have people moving naturally, teaching their kids how to garden, connecting with their neighbors and their friends and eating fresh fruits and vegetables. Then we took a look at the restaurants. We brought this gentleman in here, right here, a guy by the name of Brian Wansick. I think he's written the best book that I've ever read called Mindless Eating. He's an expert in food habits and food environments. We brought him in to look at how could we help restauranters make the healthy choice the easy choice, ones that actually could increase their bottom line. Things like, do we have to put bread on the table right away? Or can people just ask for bread and we'll take it out? How about maybe taking salt shakers off, but if people want them, bring them right out. And my question to you, is what is the one word that's on a menu that guarantees an entree will not sell? The healthy choice. People don't want the healthy choice, they want something that tastes good. 
So why not name it to sound inviting and make it taste good? And my question to you is, does every single sandwich have to come with a compost pile of french fries? Or can the default be fruits and vegetables? And if you want the french fries, of course, you can have them. Then we went to the grocery stores. We labeled what we believe to be 43 uh, Super Blue Zones foods, and in one year we saw a 37% increase of those foods. We helped these grocery stores take out sugar-sweetened beverages from the checkout waves, all the gum, candy, and sweets and salty snacks out. We put in healthy beverages and healthy snacks. Well, what happened? A 100% increase in total sales. And imagine the mothers and the fathers that have all the little kids, how nice it was for them to just go do a, a healthy checkout lane. Then we went to the schools. We brought this gal in, her name is Leslie Lyle, expert in policies and programs for schools. How many of you walked to school when you were a kid? Please raise your hand. I want you to look around, about 80%. How many of you have children or grandchildren that walk to school, raise your hand. I'd like everyone to look around. 20 years ago, 57% of kids walked to school. Today it's down to 11%. The problem with that is research shows it is safer to walk to school today than it was 20 years ago. But we all wonder, why are kids obese and overweight? But we've just re-engineered on average, three miles a day of kids' activity. So what we did with Albert Lee was suggested safe routes to school, walking school buses where parents and volunteers could walk with the kids. So by the time they got to school, they were ready to learn and focus on their studies. Albert Lee took one policy, it was simply this, to prohibit the eating in the classrooms and the hallways in their school. Now why would that benefit the health of kids? What do kids eat in the classroom and hallways? junk. We saw a 4% drop in BMI in one year. Then we formed Moais. We got people that had no idea, they weren't friends, they didn't even know each other. We got 16% of the community to say, I'll commit to walk one night a week for 10 weeks. 16% of the population did it. They walked 35 million steps and lost 17,000 pounds. Two years later, 60% of these Moais were still together. So talk about breaking down loneliness and isolation. <laughs> then we went to the employers, said, well, how can we make this atmosphere and this environment a healthier one with vending or policy or, or programs or benefits or, or active, maybe giving someone uh, $5 a day if they walk or bike to work. How can we encourage people to move more, eat less, and be more connected? We put on a huge kickoff event. We had 27% of the community show up. They raised their hand and they said, I will change one health behavior. This had never been done before. We worked in this community for 13 months the eyes of the world were on us. We had Good Morning America there, Today Show, New York Times, USA Today. When the results came in, they were astounding. City workers' health care claims down 40%. Tobacco usage in the county down 17%. We had trail counts out. We saw an increase of 56% of people walking and biking downtown. We saw an 80% increase in people walking and biking in the community. But what happened in Albert Lee seven years ago was simply this. A community that took a brand that came together to use evidence-based environmental lifestyle changes that created permanent or semi-permanent changes that they could choose, that they could lead. They got the support. They knocked down the silos and got everyone marching together. Two years later, Walter Willett from Harvard came in and bedded himself with his team and called the results stunning. He said the reason this was stunning is this was not last month's weight loss challenge or fun run or those things that don't stick. These were permanent changes to the environment. So we started looking at how could we help Albert Lee this year. 
This is Elbert Leeds Main Street and their county road. It doesn't look very livable, but after Blue Zones, their whole downtown is occupied, so they have to grow downtown. So we help them picture what a built environment change could be. This is what Albert Lee is building. They received a $40 million grant because of their built environment visioning from the state and from the county. We started in Albert Lee. We formed a partnership with a company called Healthways to expand our work. They are a well-being company that work on disease management one-on-one. -on -one. They wanted to, to turn that into a community. We wanted to scale this. Our first project was in the beach cities. I think somewhat similar to Aspen, a very healthy population, active, healthy. Um, we hired 45 employees, hired from those communities, had about 500 volunteers working. In the first two years, Gallup measured our results, and you see a drop in obesity, a drop in tobacco usage. You see people moving more. You see them eating less. This population has tracked childhood obesity for 25 years. In the last five years, they've cut childhood obesity by 50%. And you're probably going, how can they do that? Well, when we got there, 7% of kids walked to school. Today, it's 67%. Who is walking those kids to school? Volunteers, grandparents, parents. They save 15,000 car rides a day. That caught the eye of the governor of Iowa, invited us to be the cornerstone of his Healthy Estate Initiative, and currently we're working in 15 cities there, helping them become um, the healthiest uh, state in the country. We created what's called a Blue Zone Institute, so city leaders and employees from Blue Zones can come every day, or excuse me, every year, and exchange best practices. How can we get grants? How can we leverage this work and the learnings of all these communities? They've seen a $90 reduction in the cities that are blue zones compared to non-blue zone. And this is from Blue's, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. This is our largest project right here, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, population of 80,000, 800,000. We actually have over 2,000 volunteers working there. Our second statewide initiative is in Hawaii, uh, where we're there for 10 years. We kicked off a third statewide initiative in Oregon. We're in Florida, um, New York. And in five short years, we are currently in eight states and 30 communities. You're probably saying, well, how does this all work? How do you get people to show up and do this? Don't get me wrong. This is about media and marketing. It's about awareness. Awareness drives engagement. People like to be part of something big. They want their families to be healthy. They want their kids to be healthy. They want their grandparents to they want their community healthy. So our outreach um, in Iowa alone, about a billion media impressions, but when you ask people, do you know what the Blue Zone Project is, about 90% say yes, and about 43% on average are active. My name this is, is what Lynn a Blue Zone Stansbury. Project looks like I on the ground. I have lived in Cedar Rapids all my life. I was born here, and I live in the house that I grew up in. In 2008, we were flooded, and we rebuilt our house. At that time, I weighed 278 pounds. Cedar Rapids was going to start the Blue Zones project, and I was diagnosed with sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome, fibromyalgia, diabetes, and a doctor at Mayo had told me that I was obese. So I decided that the Blue Zone project was a wonderful thing for me to do because it was getting our city healthy thought about it and decided that I wanted to see my grandchildren grow up, graduate, get married, have children. I started going through my cupboards and realizing how many things that we ate that were not healthy. I don't use margarine anymore. I don't eat whole bread. We eat more fruit than probably the average family. I was lucky if I could walk down the block without being tired. Now I can walk a couple of miles. So. I have now lost 105 pounds. My husband and I walk and we ride our bikes and we do the meet me at the market in our city. And so it's made us closer. Cody, my grandson, gave me a hug one day. He said, Grandma, this is the first time I have ever gotten my arms all the way around you. And I, it just brought tears to my eyes and I still, when I think about it, it still brings tears to my eyes. My name is Lynn Stansberry. I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. 
and because of the Blue Zones project, I'm going to live a longer, happier life. So when we started this work, there was no manual. We have stumbled and we have failed and we have fallen and we have learned. We have partnered with extraordinary communities that have incredible organizations and people doing great work, creating a best practice. What's so incredible about that video is that it was sent to us at our office. It was a 17-year-old high school senior who had heard about this woman and went and interviewed her and filmed her. And I mean, the quality of it is unbelievable. Um, uh, Lynn Stansbury won an award uh, in Iowa for the number one volunteer. She pretty much single-handedly whooped that whole city of 130,000 to become Blue Zone certified. So here's the reality, and everyone in this room understands this. There is a health epidemic in America. 67% of people are either obese or overweight in America. Diabetes is skyrocketing. It's projected within 20 years that four out of 10 Americans will have diabetes. This is the one that kills me because my wife and I have a 21-year-old daughter. It is projected now that our children here in America will live less long lives than we do. And I ask you all, is that because we're stupid? Of course not. Is it because our parents loved us more than we love our kids? Of course not. We have evolved as humans over millennial from an environment of hardship and scarcity to where now we live in this environment of abundance and ease. We can't leave our house anymore without thinking, well, I gotta get in my car. Well, I can't walk or bike, it's too far. And when we do get in our cars, the typical city, and I want to applaud you, a typical city, people have to run a gauntlet of fast food restaurants. What you have done here in this valley is unbelievable. Please give yourself a hand. When we get past the fast food restaurants, we are funneled through convenience stores, when we go to rent a movie, snacks, candy. The brain is a muscle and muscles fatigue. What the Blue Zone Project does is partners with communities, utilizing the lessons of the longest lived populations, harnessing all the great work that's being done in communities to create a perfect storm of well-being. But don't get me wrong, this stuff is hard and there's no silver bullet. What Dan always says, oh Tony, let's just make sure we unleash silver buckshot. So I'd like to leave you tonight um, with this gentleman here. You remember him? <laughs> it's my buddy, Stamitis Moriarty's. Check him out. <laughs> I love that guy. So about six months ago, Dan was writing that article I told you about, the, the island that forgot to die. And like always, he was stressed and busy called me up and he said, hey, will you do me a favor, call Stamitis and ask him a question? I said, sure. So I get on the phone, phone's ringing, it picks up and here's what I hear. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> I said, Stamitis, hey, it's Tony Butner from Blue Zones. He goes, yeah, what do you want? Hurry up. I only got a couple minutes. I got my buddies, they're here, we're going up in the vineyard there. He still produces 200 liters of wine a year. He doesn't drink it all himself. <laughs> So I said, Stamitis, I just have one question. Can you tell me why you think you were cured of terminal lung cancer? It's quiet for a minute. And he goes, I don't know. It just happened. But he says, you know what, Tony, about 25 years ago, I was back in the States. And I went to go see them doctors to see what they thought. And I go, well, what'd they say? He goes, nothing. They're all dead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. I would be more than happy to answer any questions about our research or our work. Um, anyone? Questions? Comments? Yes, sir.
please. Hello. The blue zones are, that I see are mostly in yep. temperate climates, except for your experiment in Albert Lee. Yep. So, I mean, is there something about the temperate climates or? Well, I think there's a lot to be said about a Mediterranean diet, certainly. Um, I think the hardships of being in, in cold might have something to do with it. We've always thought of that, and when we are implementing these Blue Zone projects, when you're implementing them in Minnesota and Iowa, we have six months of the year where it's freezing cold. How do you keep people moving? On the other side, in California, Texas, and Florida, in the summer, it's so hot you can't go outside. So what we have done is created moais, walking moais, and potluck vegetarian moais. So when it's summer, when it's nice out, we launch walking moais so people can walk and be active. We work with city government to put together policies to do mixed use policies. So when it does get cold, or maybe it's a civic center or a large shopping center where people can come and walk. And then the opposite, when it gets ugly out, then what we do is implement um, the potluck, uh, cooking moais, and so forth. But it's, it's a good point, absolutely. I, I live on a lake in Min northern Minnesota in the summer. Which lake? Lake Eunice. It's near Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. I, I, I do the same. Anyway, there's a lady there that skis on one ski. She's 89 years old. At, once a week, she's up slalom skiing behind a boat. I love it. Thank you very much for the questions. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much for the, the question. In that blue zone solution that I had pointed out, I, uh, I mentioned that we took the 100 year food history. Um, we also looked at what they drink. And the number one thing is water. Uh, they also drink coffee. They also drink tea. So that's what we see uh, in the longest lived populations, water primarily, coffee and tea. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Two more questions, okay? Yes, on average of all the, we, we interviewed 80 year old, 90 year old and centenarians and of all them in all five blue zones on average, they sleep seven and a half hours a night. And in many cases they rest. So they're resting, they're downshifting, they're getting that rest. Thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Um, types of medicine that they would have, is this all a allopathic, I mean, our typical Western model, or do they have herbal medicine, or are they tr doing their traditional medicine, I guess is what I'm You know, I'm going to be completely honest with you, and I'm sorry I don't have a great answer for you because I wasn't part of the medical research, so I can't answer. I can answer the little that I know. <laughs> And we certainly know in, in Okinawa, they have their own medicines. Lots of herbs they're using, but I don't have a great answer, and I'm so sorry to end that way tonight. One more quick one. Can you say something about the quality of the soil? And the, isn't it in Okinawa where they grow a lot of their own food themselves? Yeah, in all the, full, in all the soil, you see them planting um, organically, right? So there are not a lot of tons of fertilizers. Uh, they're working the, the, the ground themselves. They rotate. Um, every couple um, years they'll, they'll rotate their crops, but it's all about moving naturally, eating healthy, um, healthy vegetables, fruits, legumes, and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, I've had a wonderful night. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>